digital phenotypes that, that do exist, uh, and this is getting into the basis for the work we're kind of doing, uh, tend to encode uh, our institutional understandings of the diseases. So uh, things that have been derived from literature or uh, animal model experiments or uh, clinical descriptions of patients and things like that. Uh, and obviously this is very appropriate uh, in, in most cases when we're performing things like um, differential diagnosis and things like that. But there's also a growing um, sort of understanding in the literature that there's this really, you know, sort of large gulf in uh, sort of understanding and, and priority and conceptualization of diseases um, between uh, clinicians, patients, and other health care uh, stakeholders as well. Um, we know from lots of different resources that patients have different priorities. They use different language and terminology to talk about uh, the diseases that they have. Um, and essentially our interest is to kind of, uh, by building kind of digital phenotypes of um, the patient voice and comparing these to these pre-existing institutional resources, we can help to kind of uh, bridge this gulf by mm, essentially exploding it by 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 finding out what 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 that gulf consists of, what those differences and priorities are, um, and ultimately the goal I think is 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 resources. Um, uh, or teachings, I suppose, on um, clinical awareness. Uh, I mean, if we can find that patients who suffer from a particular disease are worried about this particular phenotype, then perhaps this is something that we can uh, ask people to ask about um, or, or consider when they're, they're treating the disease and whether that makes its way into kind of um, guidelines for managing the disease is also something that can be questioned. Um, so, uh, it, sort of distilling that down into uh, sort of some aims and hypotheses. What we're trying to achieve is whether we can identify a uh, digital phenotype uh, for uh, diseases in the form of relationships between diseases and phenotypes from social media data, um, and to some extent exploring whether they recapitulate the knowledge that we have in these institutional resources. Um, and then we want to use that basis essentially to uh, find how those differ and whether we can identify uh, under-focused or perhaps even non-existent kind of areas of patient priority or uh, disease phenotype association that we don't have in these existing resources and see whether we can use those to kind of expand uh, the knowledge we have of those diseases. So um, we've done this based on a, a collaboration with White Swan, uh, who are the kind of charity uh, arm of Black Swan, who do a lot of um, exciting online kind of uh, healthcare related uh, analysis. Uh, and sort of in collaboration with them, we performed a massive uh, information extraction exercise on uh, social media, where we essentially um, uh, uh, identified mentions of diseases and phenotypes across all of these uh, social media posts uh, and we have transactions uh, which essentially is just an instance of a social media post um, and we have uh, the diseases and phenotypes that were mentioned in them. Uh, using existing uh, background knowledge, we link sort of uh, different labels that refer to the same thing to the same thing. So for example, in the case of um, heart failure, somebody might say, I don't know, heart insufficiency or low ejection fraction. Okay, a patient might not probably say that, but uh, the idea is that we link those two things to the same, uh, the same concept. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, and we have uh, an incredibly large amount of these social media posts that have mentioned diseases and phenotypes together, uh, 139 million uh, nearly, and that kind of informs some of the methodological problems that we'll talk about in a little bit. And so what we're trying to do is use this information, uh, uh, this raw information about the co-occurrence of these diseases and phenotypes to identify associations. Um, and so talking a little bit now about the methodological challenges. So a very standard way of um, quantifying uh, the um, relationship between different things that appear in a corpus, uh, so a text or a database or things like that, is something called pointwise mutual information. And essentially just a kind of uh, measure of how um, often things occur together with respect to how often they occur in total. Um, and this is fine, uh, it's, it's, it, it works, um, uh, but part of the sort of problems that arise from these are, well, there are several. Uh, the first is that 
we mentioned that we've linked uh, these instances of labels to uh, uh, kind of background knowledge um, to uh, ontologies and medical terminologies, um, and we want to make maximum use of those. So we have to kind of uh, think about how we're going to imbue our kind of uh, uh, pointwise mutual information with a sense of this. Um, we also have the problem that, sure, we can calculate this kind of sliding scale of association between phenotypes and diseases, but at what point do we say that something is associated, that it's interestingly associated, that we can associate this phenotype and this disease together? Um, and does this uh, uh, cutoff differ um, based on what disease it is? Um, we also have some sort of inherent problems with the NPMI measure itself. Uh, where if there are low occurrences in total of particular things, then you can end up with very sort of um, highly skewed values that make things look like they're um, highly associated, but really it's just a kind of uh, statistical uh, glitch. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is um, obviously uh, in, in trying to move towards our uh, goals, how do we uh, compare the phenotypes that we've associated with the existing phenotypes that exist in um, literature and other resources that we're using, uh, and then other considerations about minimizing error, and then also uh, practically and technically, you know, achieving these things on such a massive data set, um, which, which, yes. So first talking about um, integrating the background knowledge. Um, so uh, ontologies are kind of complicated artifacts, but for our purposes, what they provide us is this kind of um, this graph that describes the specificity of different diseases and phenotypes. So on the right at the top here, we have uh, the disease hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, we can tell from this background information from this uh, graph that essentially hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a cardiomyopathy, is a myocardial disorder, is a heart disorder. And in the phenotype space, we can talk about something like low back pain in the same way, back pain and pain. Um, and so the central conceit here in involving this background knowledge um, in these transactions is essentially that when we're talking about low back pain, we're also talking about back pain, we're also talking about pain. So by uh, our solution, which was essentially to uh, propagate all of the mentions of these phenotypes with their less specific but subsuming uh, counterparts in the graphs, um, we essentially make use of this background knowledge. Uh, so when we have um, sciatica in the database, we also include back pain, we also include pain, and this allows us to kind of make use of this information, um, uh, and, and, and that's good. Um, so uh, the other thing is this kind of cloud of uh, problems that surround uh, identifying good quality associations, how do we avoid skewed values, erroneous associations, um, and the key word here is kind of um, uh, significance. Um, so uh, some of the uh, biomedical resources that we looked at, the way that they do this kind of thing um, is limited in some ways. They use uh, optimization tasks based on sort of um, uh, existing sort of classification tasks with gold standards. So things like um, variant prediction. Uh, so essentially you choose a cutoff where you get your kind of uh, maximum performance on some kind of uh, training set. Uh, the problem here is that um, it's kind of overfit and some recent results have shown that this kind of approach isn't very good for finding new information because, uh, you know, we, we, we choose the subset that's very useful for recapitulating what we already know, but we're, we're not um, selecting cutoffs that, that, that give us the, uh, the, the kind of new uh, novelty that we're looking for. So the kind of uh, approach that we took was essentially to, in some ways, um, abuse is perhaps not the right word, but uh, apply in a creative way the idea of um, uh, uh, permutation testing and um, simulation. Um, so we performed 1,000 uh, simulations, um, sampling of these um, transactions with replacement uh, based on a 10% sample of the uh, uh, full data set every time, which had to be done because it's so massive, um, how we can show that the scores are stable so that that's a reasonable subsample. Uh, we removed um, phenotypes and diseases with insignificant occurrence, um, and then we borrowed another methodological tip from kind of genetic testing where, you know, we have 
you know, you know tens of thousands of associations. And uh, we also have this problem of kind of multiple testing because they're not independent. Um, so we used uh, Q values in this case uh, with an acceptable false discovery rate of 0 0.005. Uh, and then we saved only uh, significant associations from those two steps. Now, this is a kind of very uh, uh, high, high bar. Um, I mean, it's kind of unfair in some ways to perform permutation testing on the classes appearance themselves, because it's not like we're uh, randomly jumbling up words and seeing how often uh, kind of classes appear. Uh, I think that would be the, the, the statistically fair way to do it. But what we're really trying to achieve here is to use the significance testing the proxy for um, identifying um, in, in some kind of data-led way, a, a cutoff of these um, uh, phenotype disease associations that's reasonable and gives us really high quality, um, clear um, and, and minimized in error kind of associations. So um, the other kind of uh, consideration here is comparing our social media um, disease phenotype associations with um, uh, biomedical knowledge and literature knowledge. Uh, and to do this, we essentially uh, performed a kind of data integration task. We took some uh, two major recent studies which did um, disease phenotype association based on text mining of PubMed, and they used a very similar kind of uh, methodology, uh, which involved a kind of NPMI uh, measure. Uh, we also used one um, source that interpolated lots of different biomedical resources, including uh, OMIM and other uh, clinical databases that um, linked phenotypes to diseases. Um, and we named this the kind of biomedical and literature digital phenotype. And it's just all of these uh, disease phenotype associations that are known in anything that we had access to, essentially. I mean, these kind of uh, two studies uh, involve these sources and we brought them together. Um, and so uh, if you want to, I'll, I'll mention this at the beginning of the results, just in case uh, anybody who's listening wants to kind of um, play around with it. Uh, there's kind of a, a web-based dashboard where you can explore uh, this uh, digital phenotype on your uh, disease of choice uh, or disease uh, area of choice. Um, I wouldn't say that these are kind of the very final uh, results, but I mean, they're, they're, um, they're up there. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, good for kind of demonstration purposes. The username is test, the password is then a test. That's uh, easy enough. Um, so I will now talk about the results. So we identified um, very many associations. Um, in, in the millions, more so than um, the biomedical database and literature. Um, I mean, I think that it's not really comparable at this stage. Um, the other thing to note here is that obviously these um, biomedical database and literature um, uh, uh, resources, they didn't really do any significance testing. Um, and they certainly didn't use it in the same way as we did. As I said, they tend to use methods such as optimization on particular um, tasks. Um, and so the significant subset we got was actually relatively small. Most of them inhered in this uh, kind of linked database of um, 355 common diseases that we linked between these two resources. Um, and we did a sort of classification analysis to show um, whether the social media phenotypes recapitulated the literature phenotypes. And this is essentially using the um, phenotypes for the disease that we recovered from social media to predict the associated disease or the same disease based on the similarity to the phenotype um, profile that was from literature. And this showed essentially that um, for the I mean, there's a pretty strong signal essentially in, in predicting what disease it is, which shows that um, we're, 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 we're showing up sense. It's not just random uh, phenotypes that we're, we're, we've recovered here. Uh, we're describing the same diseases uh, and that's good. Um, but on top of this, we managed to identify 11,000, nearly 12,000 uh, novel associations. Um, that means that we identified them as significant with this very high bar of um, the occurrence of the disease and phenotype overall in the data set, and also in terms of the actual association between the disease and the phenotype. Um, and uh, it's um, this side of the high bar, but then also that um, this is compared with 
any positive association at all in the biomedical database and literature um, uh, uh, set. So, I mean, um, this really has to be something that's um, very under-focused and has no, no visible association in any of these data sets to be considered novel phenotype. Um, so actually, I think it's quite uh, interesting that the number is so high. Um, and that's uh, that's fine. Um, so, uh, upon some sort of further analysis of the composition of these kinds of um, uh, novel phenotypes, we found that uh, 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 sort of overrepresented, uh, sorry, overrepresented in these sets are nervous system phenotypes and um, and digestive phenotypes. And we use Clarigi, which is another tool we developed for compositional and discriminatory analysis of digital phenotypes to sort of identify what the composition of these um, nervous system phenotypes were. And um, many of them were, uh, or in fact, the, the vast majority of them were essentially mental health related phenotypes. Um, and you can see how this starts to build a kind of um, interesting narrative surrounding the increased priority of uh, uh, mental health that uh, patients are kind of uh, going through as part of their experience of the disease that they have, um, and especially in contradistinction to the kind of relative underfocus or lack of representation there is or lack of discussion there is in uh, literature um, surrounding the sort of nature of the relationship between these diseases and phenotypes. Again, these are things that don't appear in literature um, very much. I mean, it's, it, they tend not to be things without any basis at all, um, but they're things that aren't positively associated, you know, so it will be things like um, anxiety is not particularly associated with this disease, um, even though it would seem based on the social media information that this is very much the case. Um, so uh, we can also take a look uh, at some of the kind of classical um, diseases that have been kind of um, uncharitably excluded from research in some cases uh, historically, and those with kind of complicated and relatively poorly understood phenotypic profiles. There are kind of some kind of interesting uh, relationships that show up. One that was kind of curious was uh, the relationship between common cold and no social interaction. Uh, and uh, we also have um, everybody's favorite um, COVID-19 in there as well, uh, which came up with many sort of novel phenotypes not described um, in literature. Um, and this is fine. Um, so as a kind of uh, conclusion there, the, we've essentially built this social media digital phenotype and we've shown that it recapitulates and extends uh, biomedical and literature knowledge that we brought together from many different sources. Uh, we've shown, you know, that we can find this kind of plethora of different uh, novel phenotypes with um, little basis or association. And I think essentially what is a proxy for under focus in, in literature. Um, we also found this kind of um, overrepresentation of mental health and digestive phenotypes uh, in this set of novel uh, associations. Um, and I think that this is essentially kind of exciting. Um, some words about uh, different limitations. Um, so the manner of the relationship between the disease and the phenotype is unknown. Uh, and this is a kind of fundamental um, limitation of this kind of analysis. Um, we're, we're not classifying the kind of relationship between the thing and ultimately, um, neither do any of the biomedical and literature derived resources. Um, they're, they're, they're similarly uh, derived from associations. So uh, it's just a question of having to provide a little bit of kind of um, uh, interpretation of this kind of association. So, you know, um, the, the phenotype won't necessarily be a symptom of that disease. It may be a symptom of a side effect of a drug or something like that. Um, in, in public data, we also have this problem of kind of errors of variability. Uh, so there's this uh, phenotype called uh, plethora, which I think it has something to do with thrombocytopenia or something. I don't know whether I've remembered that correctly, but obviously it also has um, a uh, particular meaning in regular language. So we end up in this kind of curious situation where um, uh, plethora, the 
um, phenotype is associated with schizophrenia because perhaps people are talking about like a plethora of different things to do with that. Um, and so again, it's this situation where we have to uh, perform a little bit of interpretation of what's coming up here and um, realize that you know, we're not necessarily always talking about these labels, these, these, these phrases in the same context. Um, the other thing is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're, we're kind of setting the bar extremely high here uh, to, um, and then the reason for that is multifold. It's, it's to try and, it's to bypass this problem of, of trying to find uh, cutoffs, but I think it also implies that, you know, there's a lot more value in this data set that we can um, identify with sort of additional analysis. Um, and also we're, we're currently kind of only looking at the um, binary, um, you know, is this associated or not? But we do actually have these NPMI values and, and, and even where we don't have completely novel phenotypes, we also have differing rankings of, um, of, uh, of priority. And that's where we can kind of expand a little bit. Um, on the on the on the differing focus but i think that for a really stark kind of um view on these things we can first look at things that you know just completely aren't associated at all in um in literature uh and that's fine uh so the current status of this work is that well i mean what i just said basically um i'm kind of working on a uh manuscript at the moment um with a kind of um, high level description of what was done, um, some overall analysis drilling into this kind of um, uh, mental health kind of focus. I also want to add like one or two kind of really interesting kind of um, use cases in diseases or disease areas. So, I mean, if anybody is interested in collaborating on that, particularly if you have the clinical experience to be able to do this kind of uh, interpretation or work together on doing it, uh, I would be very interested in that. Um, and then I think there's plenty of space to um, uh, uh, do sort of additional projects based on this data set surrounding particular diseases or disease areas. Um, another thing I want to do is not only to compare it with our literature understanding of these diseases and literature conceptualizations, but also to compare it essentially directly with the um, digital phenotypes that arise when we analyze clinical text. And this is the kind of thing that we would be doing um, essentially in the context of the QV hospital, uh, if we can get, uh, if we can find a nice project to do this, but um, I think this would be good. Um, and then we also want to see whether we can um, use this additional phenotype information to improve the performance of things like differential diagnosis and other things that um, essentially we use these digital phenotypes for. Um, and I think what would also be quite nice is if we can, you know, really create a resource for, you know, the patients care about this. So this is what clinicians should be asking about. And if we can find a way or a pipeline to make that happen, I think that's a kind of very uh, uh, good outcome of this kind of work um, uh, and whether further sort of analysis resolution or nature of relationship needs to be known for that kind of thing. I think that's the kind of uh, uh, direction of interest that's kind of guiding me on that. But yes, um, and thanks. To everyone who has helped uh, with this work, um, particularly in the Kutos lab and uh, Paul Schofield in Cambridge, and then of course uh, White Swan, who did uh, a lot of the initial text analysis of um, Twitter and friends as well. So thank you.